Well, that's it. Apparently inflation is over and the market's ready to keep the party going here. This week was the nail in the coffin. I've got a very interesting CPI chart to show you today, which I think will prove I'm only being semi-sarcastic in reality based on that first comment. And of course, we will go through all the normal data points to build a game plan for the upcoming week's worth of trade. As always, check out the links listed down below in the description, hit the thumbs up button, and subscribe if you've not already done so, and stay tuned until the end of today's show. I've got two additional trade ideas to share with you that you won't want to miss. With that said, let's jump right into the charts. So kicking things off on the SPY weekly timeframe, talking about candle structure and location as we always do. For structure this past week, we're certainly dealing with a solid green bodied bar, very minimal upper wick here, not enough to read into from a psychological perspective, and the buyers did a fantastic job closing strong at the top of the weekly range. So buyers are in control from a structural perspective. On the location front, on the bar to bar count, we've certainly got a very nuanced higher low, but a very obvious higher high. So two for two structure and location does go to the buyers. If we think about the pattern we discussed in last week's episode of the weekly watch list, we called this a three bar play, right? Bar number one, bar number two is above the 50% retracement, bar number three gets a break of the equal highs and closes at the top. That is a bullish formation. And we've also cleaned up the very precise touches that we had from these three bars here. If you think about this as an overall range, these were all inside bars, one, two, and three here. We've now broken that and closed above, which is again, a bullish indication. If this is going to give us a true range double, we would expect that the market could make a move closer to somewhere in here, right around 450. We'll also see that as a target from the volume nodes in just a moment. But one of the comments I also made in last week's episode is that if we need to break those highs, repair the top, and then come back into range, it could certainly turn into a look above and fail. We would see that with a weekly bar that closes back within range, and we could also be a little bit more granular on the daily time frame chart and be on the lookout for a lower high back within range in the coming week's worth of trade. So that's something we'll discuss in just a moment, but we certainly don't have it yet on the weekly time frame chart. For now, the trend remains up with lows, higher lows, higher lows, higher lows. I would start to make the argument that these lows of the balance could become the next set we want to watch out for, but more meaningful weekly pullbacks, they only happen when you get a daily downtrend. And ever since the breakout of this level right here, we've never actually flipped into a daily downtrend. So I would still reinforce the idea that 420 could produce something that does this on the weekly time frame chart, but I would start to carry forward this as well as being a little bit of a precautionary level in the first place. Again, we'll talk about it on the daily time frame chart in just a moment. Are the anchored view apps in play at all here? Not really. Uh, I would just remind you that this one coming from the really beginning of the rally back here, it's confluence around that 420 zone, but it's certainly not in play this upcoming week. How about the volume profile? I would just remind you that once again, there's your 420 high volume node, but we've also, interestingly enough, broken out over this high volume node, right? So not only was it three equal highs on those weekly bars, it was also the high volume node. We've resolved that or we've started to resolve it in the upward direction. The next major overhead high volume node to target is almost at that range double closer to uh, 454. Again, we'll see that on the daily in a moment, but it's also prior weekly structure in here as well. Before we move to the daily to get a bit more granular, I want to point out a couple of Fibonacci perspectives, just two of them. If we come in from the all time high to the October low, we're spending more time above the 61.8. Just remember that the more time we can spend above, the greater the odds for the 100% retracement. I'm not calling for all-time highs this week, next week, or even the week after that, but the odds continue to improve the more time we spend over the 61.8. I don't know about you, but this looks much more like acceptance as opposed to distribution or any sort of quick snap above and failure back down underneath that 61.8. The next Fibonacci perspective is from the low up to the top, and once again, just providing a little bit of confluence at the top of the ascending triangle pattern, the breakout level, the pullback level, all that good stuff. It's your 38.2 at this point in time with the local high that was made as of Friday with the gap up and somewhat hold up there towards those highs. So overall weekly chart remains bullish. Let's get a bit more granular on the daily. Let's first evaluate the expected move for the week. If you're not familiar with this study, check out the tutorial in the top right hand corner. If we're contained by the upper bound, the number is 454.95. That of course would imply a big time higher high. And if we're contained by the lower bound, the number is 443.65, that would imply a big time higher low. What I really like about the expected move low here is that it's confluence with your prior resistance at 444, and it's also right around the gap close area as well, just providing a little bit of structural support around that area as well, not just being priced in from the options market. So expected move here is undoubtedly bullish. We know that we're certainly dealing with a daily uptrend with consecutive series of higher
higher lows being formed. And of course, we've got the equal high breakout here producing a higher high on Friday. Because we have the higher high, we certainly know that the daily time frame chart can pull back and we will be looking for a higher low. What would the ideal higher low be? Of course, it would just be right around this prior area. The breakout top would be picture perfect gap fill reversal, lower edge of the weekly expected move right around that cluster of 444. We'll get more granular on the hourly in just a moment, but I want to talk about psychology here, of course. On CPI, we get a gap and go, leaving a partial gap underneath us. If the sellers were stronger, they would have closed that gap. It simply didn't happen. On Thursday, we get a gap, we get a gap fill reversal and close strong at the highs of Thursday's range. Once again, if sellers were going to take you know that opportunity and run with it on the early momentum to close the gap, they would have closed inside of Wednesday's range. It simply wasn't the case. Of course, a little bit of credit where credit is due on Friday. There's certainly some profit taking, but did we even come anywhere close to the low of Thursday? No, the market was one time framing higher all week here, which is certainly a bullish phenomenon. If we do get straight up continuation, your upper target outside of the weekly expected move comes from structure at 457. Let's take a look at the hourly time frame chart to really build that roadmap into the upcoming week's worth of trade here. First and foremost, once again, Thursday's gap fill reversal and then closure at the top of Thursday's range does strike me as a bullish phenomenon, right? Technically on Wednesday, the CPI gap up, we produced an intraday lower high. The concern here was that if we flushed the equal lows there at the low of day, the gap would have closed and so on and so forth. Once again, it simply did not happen with the very strong PPI report, which we'll dive into when we get to the fundamental section of today's video. Friday, what do we do? Well, here's Thursday's opening range. That is Thursday's opening range, right? It was actually a threat of liquidation break early on on Thursday's session. As we were just grinding sideways here, the threat was for, hey, if longs are trying to position here with bad location and we snap, liquidation break comes in and probably sends us back down further into Wednesday's range didn't happen. But once again, Friday's low respects the top of Thursday's opening range high. That number is 448.75. So all things here really point to number one, the buyers being in control. And number two, the sellers just not being aggressive. Stronger sellers would not have cared about Thursday's opening range high. They would have closed it weaker in that uh, in that session, right? You can see Friday afternoon, we actually close with an hourly hammer candle into the 4 p.m. bell. If we take out a couple of Fibonacci perspectives here, let's zoom it out just a little bit. We want to come in from the head of the inverted head and shoulders way back here to the high, your 38.2 is low and behold, right around the lower edge of the weekly expected move, that magic 444 equal high zone, that does strike me as being bullish. And if we come in with the fibs from here up to the high, where is your 61.8, right? The 61.8 is always the line in the sand, just like we talked about it on the weekly. If we were to breach the 61.8, the odds of going to the 100% retracement increase, it's your gap fill reversal. It's also, as we discussed on Wednesday night, the double bottom neckline at 442.50. So that's some confluence areas for you. We can also throw on the anchored view app. And if we throw it on from the breakout areas, this is coming from your head. This is coming from the double bottom, right? First and foremost, the top of the gap, you're also getting some confluence with the anchored view app. So a deeper pullback here early on in the week that respects the gap or that just hovers around this 444 and then can recapture this anchored view app. Very, very bullish. If we go even further than that, you're still getting gap fill reversal confluence over time, of course, with your head anchored view app from way back here, inverted head and shoulders, right? So just some confluence levels. I think it really does support the idea that we should be looking for more of pullback buys here, not necessarily big time new money shorts. So where are the pullback levels that we really care about? Obviously, the first one would be as this slowly migrates higher, if we get a pullback to go here and then we can find a hammer candle, we can find a double bottom, we can find an inverted head and shoulders on a smaller time frame, like a five or 15 minute chart, that's a great pullback by confluence with your anchored view app. If we go further than that, it's all about 444. Hopefully that one should be abundantly obvious. Something that comes here looking for the same ideas, hammers, double bottoms, inverted head and shoulders. I would want to be a pullback buyer at this level and in this zone here, not necessarily a new money short. Now to get there, of course, there may be very short term short opportunities, I would not you know, certainly do not overstay your welcome is the main point here on the short side. If we get a lower high underneath, yeah, absolutely. Maybe this turns into a little bit of head and shoulders like that. Lower high underneath 448.75, you can look to go here. But once again, I think that the pullback buy opportunity is far superior than trying to short this for the move in the downward direction. Anyhow, the stronger shorts, as we were talking about on the weekly time frame chart, only emerge here if we get lower highs underneath 444. Why? Because that turns into look above and then in here, 
fail, in which case we would certainly target the bottom end of the range, which brings us way back on down to the head of this overall pattern. We would, you know, re, you know, put the levels back on the chart, give you the accurate number when and if that's in play, but that's more than a two or three sigma move outside of this week's expected move. It would take a black swan event in my estimation to really make it down towards those levels. So we'll update you on Wednesday if it even starts to become a threat, but it's so far away that once again, the pullback buy is really more optimal for this upcoming week. Let's take a look now at some supporting evidence. Market internals are always exhibit A. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner. Let's keep it very simple here. Bulls or bears in control for the majority of the week. Certainly the bulls. In terms of volume flows, we had substantial flows in the early stages of this week. Friday, noticeable change in tone net flows on the week are certainly well above positive 500 million. It does strike me as substantial. As the market was rallying more substantially, of course, the advanced decline line is closer to the trend higher zone, never extended through it, never in an overcorrelated state, which strikes me as a healthy move. Once again, Friday is totally a change in tone. I'll get to that in just a second here. In terms of the cumulative builds out of the tick, strong, 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 strong. And I specifically want to focus here on Wednesday, right? This is really, it should be expected that on a big gap up, of course, we're going to be over the prior day's close. So you're going to get bullish volume flows. You're going to get bullish advanced decline line. But remember that the tick will never lie. The fact that Wednesday's CPI and even Thursday on the follow through day higher did see a cumulative build that was positive throughout the duration of the day speaks to the fact that during the intermarket hours, basically, regardless of the gap, things were continuing to get bought up. It wasn't just the fact that it was a gap up and we were kind of stagnant for the day across the exchange, things were definitely more bullish than bearish. Now, once again, a noticeable shift in tone on the Friday session. The reason I'm pointing out Fridays here is because it would be totally reasonable for the market to pull back after the rally that we've seen here. Remember, markets do not move in a straight line unless we're approaching a new paradigm shift for markets. Very rare that that happens. So some give and take is totally normal. And there's a clear shift in tone from Friday. Be open to the idea that we could see these pullbacks develop. And once again, on the hourly chart, as we just saw, there's some very obvious places where we want to be looking for pullback buys. Overall, internals do support the idea that buyers are in control. Exhibit B is market profile. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right hand corner for a brief brief explainer for the most part, what was going on with value and point of control from Friday, certainly higher in terms of value in the overall profile. The point of control is definitely more centralized, but the point here, the main takeaway is that it did not close weak at the lows, even though price did move lower on Friday's session. And even more importantly is the fact that we have a spike from the Thursday session, right? That's this L and M period in here. The only reason the market stopped moving higher was because the bell rang at 4 p.m., right? So the spike indicates that we don't know whether or not these prices are fair. The fact that value area was in inside of that spike or even overlapping to up would strike me that, hey, the spike prices are fair. It's not an outright rejection of these higher prices. So even though we did close lower on the Friday session, value was accepting of the spike higher from the closing move on Thursday session. That is an important nuance. We also have decent excess at the highs as well as the lows from the Friday session. So no poor levels to clean up from that perspective. And I would also remind you, just like this is a spike and it seems as though value is accepting high overlapping to up basically we also had a spike from this tuesday session wednesday is the gap up all of the acceptance has been above that spike now granted it was the cpi catalyst nonetheless value is being found higher here it's not trying to migrate lower to where it once was in that inside weekly range we were just discussing on the spy what about the weekly performance of our sectors certainly if we take a look the xlb materials led the pack here up 3.22 percent not great considering it's a lighter weight kind of neutral sector from a risk on or off perspective but just underneath we have xly discretionary the tech sector communication at the bottom of the barrel, even though it's all green on the week, we do see the XLP for consumer staples, definitely more D for defensive energy. It would have been better if financials were higher up on this list, but we'll get to that chart in just a moment. Let's start looking through the structural charts and see what's going on here. Any leadership issues out of the XLB? Not really. It's trying to make a move towards the top of this overall range. Upward pressure is upward pressure. It's such a lightweight sector. It's not going to make or break your S&P. XLY, this is where things get interesting. New higher high above the prior pivot top on your XLP. 
B-L-Y. Anything bearish to say about this chart? Not really. Inverted hammer on the Friday session. Sure, if we do come back down into this range, aka a move underneath Friday's low, you're looking at, you know, maybe a gap close here, but is there an opportunity for a daily higher low? Absolutely. No real threats from the XLY. Give us a little pullback here. Maybe the S&P pulls back, closes that gap, and then we look for the higher low pullback, basically, which is the argument on the SPY hourly. In terms of upper targets, massive room to run up towards 180, 150. Just remember that these levels are coming from 2022 when the VIX was, you know, nasty up in over 2050 as a floor. Here's the XLK. What's going on with our tech sector? Anything interesting or concerning rather over here? Again, inverted hammer from the Friday session. Could we pull back here? Absolutely. Can we find a higher low? Absolutely. 173.35 is the number to watch. We did make a new intraday all-time high, not closing, but intraday all-time high on Friday. Again, very difficult to say anything bearish about these charts because we now have the higher high. The double top is much more so off the table, even if it were going to turn into a lower high double top. Remember that your neckline's down here at 167.65. No threats, all right? So XLK, not really a big deal. Could it pull back this week? Absolutely be open to the idea that the market can see a pullback, but structure will not really deteriorate here. Same thing with the XLC. It just goes without saying, where's your higher low? Anywhere above this breakout point, 65.55 out of the XLC. Real estate, lighter weight sector, a little bit more deeper defensive. We've been talking about inventory and seasonality here. No surprises that it's kind of higher, especially with rates backing off the past couple of days. Let's take a look at utilities. Again, any issues here with leadership? No, it is D for defensive. It's kind of trying to break out over this weekly double bottom neckline. If it does break out, and even if it moves to the top of this range in here, it's not exhibiting leadership. It's not up at 60, or excuse me, 78. Not really seeing a big concern out of that. Industrials pulling back after a brand new all-time high. We've hit the measured move target at 109 um, after the gap up, obviously, on the Wednesday session. Hammer candle on Friday, right off of the prior all-time high. That's not path, that's prior all-time high, 107.88. I mean, even if it goes further than that, you have a little bit more wiggle room down to 107.50s roughly for a higher low. And that's like respecting the picture perfect structure in a, you know, in a weekly trend, any higher lows, if the daily flips into a downtrend, can afford to be over 103. So still bullish in this sector as well. The XLV couldn't have asked for anything better, especially with the UNH earnings on Friday. So don't get me wrong, there was some assistance with the earnings call there that obviously sent prices higher. But remember, this is the second heaviest weighted sector by market cap. We can't really afford for it to be falling off of a cliff. The concern was that this range was going to be breaking down here. And if we flushed 129, there's not a lot of support till we came back down to 127. 630. So the fact that this is back in range, it's not exhibiting leadership, but it's also not falling off of a cliff. This is fantastic for your S&P 500. XLF, some concerns, right? Some concerns here, but there's a couple of charts I want to show you uh, in the meantime. So XLF, bearish engulfer on the Friday session after JP Morgan earnings are kind of a blowout there, big beat uh, on the uh, interest rate revenue that they're bringing in, but we close weak underneath the green bodied bar. Let me ask you this from a trend perspective. Is there any concerns after after a higher high about the daily chart flipping suddenly into a downtrend? And to me, the answer is no. Not only are we still above the breakout point of this as kind of an ascending triangle, but we're also well above this. Even if we do continue to pull back, I think we can catch ourselves for a higher low. That would be constructive overall for the XLF as a whole. And another thing I want to point out is just remember what comprises the XLF, right? We're not seeing the greatest moves out of some of the banks, but the top holding in the XLF is of course Berkshire, then we get JP Morgan, then it's Visa and MasterCard, which used to be inside of the XLK tech sector. Those charts look great, right? So remember that these are heavy weighted components of the XLF. If you go on over to something like V for Visa, what does this chart look bearish? The answer to that question to me is absolutely not. It's broken out over these highs. Looks good. The next one was MasterCard, right? So payment processors, uh, does this chart look bearish? The answer is no. So although the banks may not come in fantastic, let's take a look at JP Morgan, of course. Um, it produced a higher high. It's pulling back. It closed the gap undoubtedly, but can it find a weekly higher low anywhere over this breakout point? The answer to me is absolutely yes. That's 144 out of JP Morgan. So the XLF chart, it's Itself. It doesn't look great as a bearish engulfer, but if we look at some of those components, it doesn't strike me as the end of the world. Structurally, I would love to see this continue to build out an uptrend here and eventually make it back to and through the banking crisis breakdown area. So that was a long-winded way of walking through the financials, but we know it's been the thorn in the side of the S&P. It was worth doing. Here's the energy sector. Any issues with leadership? No, it is D for defensive. Big time move lower on the Friday session there. XLP, D for defensive. Any leadership issues? Absolutely not. Stuck sideways in the midpoint 
point of its range. Why do we keep going all, you know, over all of this stuff week in and week out? It's like, hey, the XLK is fine, the XLC is fine, XLY is fine. It's like we just are on repeat broken record. The point of doing it week in and week out is that it will be very, very obvious when something bad starts to happen. When we can noticeably say, hey, this is not like it was for the past three, four, five weeks in a row. That's when you have to put your thinking cap on and say, okay, time to, you know, maybe we do get some more deterioration out of the S&P. So I know it seems like we're long-winded every time with the sectors, but it has a purpose. Hopefully you've been following along with that. Here's the sector ratio grid for just a different visual. If you're not familiar with this screen, check out the video tutorial in the top right-hand corner on how to set it up. Overall, the XLK still holding in there, but once again, we do want to start to see a breakout of this kind of wedge that's been forming in here. Let's see if we can get a higher high out of that XLK that would maintain the bullish stance. XLV with that gap up day on Friday. Of course, a little uptick here, but still in a downtrend that is okay, considering it is more D for defensive. XLF, it tried to recapture that 50 SMA, no dice on the first attempt. Now the big test is, can we get ourselves a higher low on the ratio that would start to build out? Definitely inverted head and shoulders constructive. We're not there yet. We're kind of projecting into the future, watching for that higher low. That would be ideal for financials. XLY speaks for itself very risk on. Closest tie to the XLK is communications. Higher high on Thursday, pulling back slightly on Friday. No big concerns, especially because it was sideways for so long, starting to perk up once again. That is a risk on look. Risk off is not a threat. Risk off is not a threat. Energy gets rejected at the 50 SMA, so still staying in a downtrend here. And real estate is much more so sideways. So not really seeing any issues with risk off coming to overpower risk on. I've got a different illustration to start with today. This is the XLK versus the XLU. So it's still the same idea. We're comparing a risk on sector to a risk off sector, but I thought that the XLY over XLP was getting a bit distorted. Even this is looking like risk on remains the current stance of the market grinding higher. It's definitely slowing down a little bit. If we do pull back, looking to catch ourselves at the 50 SMA, that would coincide beautifully with a pullback in the SPY, in my estimation at least. So that's number one. And then of course, we'll look at the classic XLY over the XLP, just continues to grind in the upward direction. Once again, nothing about any of the sector relationships are overly indicative of risk off anywhere you know close to being seen. Could we pull back? Yes. Could the market see a pullback? Yes. Is it full-blown risk off? No. What about the dollar? Certainly falling off of a cliff underneath the bottom of its overall balance range here at 101. So looking for lower highs to continue the upward pressure in equities underneath 101 in the dollar specifically. If we take a look at something like the gold contract, it is confirming with a rotation back above the 1920 and even recapturing this level right here, the prior flush point which led to this most recent downdraft at 1955. If this can build out as bull flag consolidation and break to the top of the range, it would continue to look good for the dollar to stay underneath that 101 level. I also want to show you silver today, uh, just because the break and retest is going to be a very beautiful trade if it does want to unfold. So here's the silver futures. If we can get the retest of 2440s and find some sort of buy setup in here looking really good for a double bottom neckline break, or you could just call it a classic break and retest on prior resistance from in here. Over time, you would of course target first the equal high, and then back here, the higher high would be up around 2635. Silver futures are not for the faint of heart. Use SLV if you're more of an ETF type trader. Let's take a look at what's going on with our interest rates now. TNX, the 10 year, just full blown reversal after this kind of pop in here. So, what I like to say, uh, or I guess the way we could describe it basically, is this was the jobs numbers, a lot of fear around this. This is CPI, this is inflation becoming a nothing burger over the last week's worth of trade, basically. So, watching for this to remain underneath the 38.2 consolidate back in here, that would be a full blown look for the head and shoulders over time. One once, when, when, and if I should say, we are underneath 3640, very, very bullish in theory for the tech sector. We'll see if that does unfold as a situation over time. Something that we can also look at here, we've been you know monitoring this over the past couple of videos, is the ZT. This is the inverted ZT. So the two-year uh, futures here on interest rates, or the two-year bond, I should say, really, is putting in an equal high. And now the threat is, if I zoom in on this, if we think about this from a trend perspective, right? Of course, this is an equal high break. We find the equal high to back here, but in this sequence, it's a higher high. Now that we've retraced all of that move, we kind of have an equal low on the table. If we produce a lower high and flush it, you would have to imagine what that implies for the Fed funds futures. Let's take a look at the tracker tool now. This would be a decent look for inflation and the Fed funds rate actually coming down because inflation is dissipating, right? So let's do that now. So no surprises from 
from the tracker tool that we're still scheduled for a 25 basis point rate hike in the next meeting, which is on July 26th. But what's interesting is if we look at the November meeting, because this is what we've been tracking for the second rate hike, right? It's one versus two hikes into the end of this year. Going out to November, things actually decreased in terms of odds of the second rate hike as we got CPI and PPI. That's this move here and this move here, indicating a hold of 525 to 550. But you can see Friday instantly shakes things up. All of a sudden, we're pricing in higher odds, more than 50% now, of a rate hike for the November timeframe meeting. So you have to ask yourself the question, what came out on Friday that really drove these expectations higher for the rate hike? And if you go up to the probabilities tab, you can see it here, 53% probabilities of that secondary rate hike coming in for the month of November. And on Friday, what we ultimately got was inflation expectations, right? And this is, in my estimation, why that sort of probability skewed to the secondary rate hike. You'll notice that the previous was 3.3. People are expecting inflation to stick around with a 3.4 coming in on Friday's session. However, I think that the probabilities of that second rate hike are going to fluctuate dramatically between now and November. Obviously, there's plenty of time, but Jerome Powell has been very clear that if they are going to remain data dependent, these are more so the numbers that they care about, not so much what's going on with inflation expectations. Now, don't get me wrong. I totally understand that when you have expectations entrenched, it can kind of drive inflation itself. But for the most part, all of these numbers came in as blowouts this week. CPI massively underneath the expectations and PPI underneath the expectations, but also revisions in the downward direction from the prior reads in massively important directions, right? So core PPI goes from what was prior point. Uh, Two, right? You can see that off in that little tag there. Prior point two goes to point one, and prior negative, negative. Point three goes to even better, negative 0.4. And if precursor PPI is going to lead to the next CPI read, these are certainly steps in the right direction. Now, here's that very interesting CPI chart that I told you I was going to share today. And this illustrates the lag impacts of the Fed's policy, specifically the sticky side of the inflation equation, quote unquote sticky, which is services, right? So here's where the Fed starts, you know, to really see the efforts uh, or, or the, um, you know, the results of their efforts, I shall say, out of energy, goods, and food. Food, right, you can see the green, orange, and red come down substantially there. Energy is even negative as of right now. But even as the Fed is raising rates, what does services inflation do? It continues to tick in the upward direction. So the lag impacts took almost a full eight-ish months to be realized out of the services sector. Is this going to continue in the downward direction? It certainly could based on what the Fed is doing. Now they're tapping the brakes a little bit. We'll see if they have to heat it back up or not. But if this continues to migrate in the downward direction, then the lag impacts are ultimately working. And if the services side of inflation in terms of the equation can get closer to 2% over the next span of, I don't know, a couple months or so, it would certainly allow the Fed to say, hey, we were more responsible in navigating the quote soft landing. And that's looking pretty good. So just illustrating here, the lag impacts, they're starting to play catch up. We will no longer have the base effects as the next CPI reads come out. But for the most part, watching to see if services inflation can continue in the downward direction here. Once again, lag is working. And that is what we wanted to see from the service services side of the equation. Let's take a look at the earnings calendar for the coming week's worth of trade. Anything interesting here? Absolutely. It's going to be a blockbuster week. We've got Bank of America. We've got Charles Schwab, Morgan Stanley from the banking side of things, of course. Goldman will report on Wednesday before the open. And then Tesla Netflix as a combo, deadly combo, on Wednesday after the close. Keeping a very close eye on that, we get some chip stuff with TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductors, Thursday before the open, and it will continue to heat it up as we move into the following week's worth of trade. So from an earnings perspective, if earnings come in horribly, that could lead to a market pullback. Whether or not they do is yet to be seen, and I would keep a very open mind and not want to swing trade things through earnings as we move through this cycle in particular, because the market has already rallied so substantially. Now, as a trader, that's a rule of thumb. As a swing trader or someone who's using these videos as more of investment, sort of, you know, keeping tabs on the pulse of the market, that's up to you to decide. But I would be very, very cautious in this earnings cycle specifically, because the expectations were set so high from NVIDIA specifically. That's one of the ones that's going to be extremely interesting. Expectations were set so high. If we come in underneath those expectations, I think you start to see some of the deflation inflation of the AI mania bubble that we've been in for the past, I don't know, couple of weeks or even months at this point. How do the risk appetite charts look?
outlook. TLT bonds making a new impression for a lower low into the end of this week speaks to solid risk appetite in equities down below. And if that relationship is broken, then we can look at short dated bonds in relation to longer duration bonds. And this uptick from the jobs report was undone with the CPI report. This is still certainly sideways in here. This is what fears of a recession look like. This is what fears of a recession look like. This is obviously much different. This is obviously much different. We did not make new higher highs in these sequences. Let's take a look at the HYG. This thing continues to be a wild wildebeest. Some folks got a kick out of that one in the last video. Look at the volatility here. I mean, we're certainly in a broadening megaphone type pattern, but if this is going to do anything, right, the higher high that was produced here speaks to decent moves out of equities down below with the higher high and has started to negate the lower low that was taking place in here with the higher low out of equities down below. So keeping an open mind, if the HYG is going to become important, what we want to see happen is a higher low with the pullback out of equities down below. And that would certainly speak to better odds for continuation, stronger uh, correlated continuation in the upward direction here. That's the HYG in a nutshell. Let's take a look at something like our Bitcoin chart. I really want to highlight this one because I think there's an opportunity here for a bit of a failure in the downward direction. So we'll keep an eye on it. But notice on the Ripple news, of course, we take out this uh, high of the bull flag pattern from the BlackRock announcement back here. And where do we find ourselves as of the close of last week? Right back down at the lows. So you have to think like, hmm, why couldn't there be a second wind here with the Ripple news if this breaks down? Remember, it's not a one to one with equities, but it would totally make sense that if Bitcoin fails the bull flag and the market's pulling back, hey, kind of adds up as a reasonable opportunity here, noting that Bitcoin has failed at the highs, just kind of ties into the pullback narrative at this point, but it doesn't really jeopardize things. If we scrunch this chart up, let's go to a weekly on Bitcoin. We're spending too much time on this, but overall, right, we are certainly still in a weekly uptrend. Let's see if we can catch ourselves for a higher low, consolidate out, and that would be bullish over time, but intra-week upcoming, we could certainly see a little bit of pullback out of crypto. Breath indications out of new highs versus lows. They are above the zero line. I'm leaving it intentionally zoomed out for today's episode because at First, we test the zero line a bunch of times, and then in hindsight, looks really obvious with the market move. Again, here, we test the zero line a couple of times, and then in hindsight, it looks really obvious with the market move in here. We've tested the zero line a number of times. Will it look obvious in hindsight with a move that does this over time? Certainly a possibility, as long as we're not making big negative impressions here out of new highs versus lows around negative 500, I would say that we're avoiding the bearish look from a breath perspective. Things also look good here on the SPX A200R, making a new weekly higher high with the breakout the market had this week. SPX A50 are same idea. Remember that this is a daily time frame chart, one to one with what we have down below. New higher high, a little bit of a mild pullback on Friday. We're approaching over correlated zone or like overbought zone technically, but I wouldn't really count it as being like a big contrarian indication yet. You would need to flip into a daily downtrend out of the S&Ps before looking for that counter trend type move. If we look at something like the RSP, equal weight S&P up on top, certainly can pull back and find a higher low over the equal high breakout point at 150. Let's zoom in on that. So something that does this is still constructive. We'll see if that coincides with the weighted equities down below. This paired with something like this speaks to good breath out there in the market. The next one is where we're still seeing some struggles out of the Dow industrials, even with JP Morgan earnings unable to get up and over the resistance point here on industrials up top, whereas transports continue to march on in the upward direction. If it does turn into a substantial divergence like what we had in here, we will have to see a more aggressive breakdown out of industrials. As of right now, we simply don't have it. If you think about industrials as building out an ascending triangle in here, when this first divergence took place, we actually had lower highs in place out of industrials. This time around, even as transports march higher, we're producing equal highs and pressing into it with higher lows along the way. So a little bit more optimistic this time around, but it certainly hasn't resolved yet. It's not rainbows and butterflies. It would have to get up and over 34, uh, yeah, 34.5 uh, K roughly out of your Dow industrials. VIX volatility sub 15 once again here, indicative of healthy market conditions for more bullish environments out there. If we take a look behind the curtain, and one more time at the VIX. This remains elevated in the overall range here, but just remember the more time we spend closer to 75, the more likely it is that we've hit complacency zone and all it takes is the littlest little uptick out of volatility and things kind of hit the fan, so to speak, in here, like what we've seen in that instance, kind of what you've seen in this instance. As long as the VIX isn't aggressively getting price acceptance over the 103, I would say it's nothing to be concerned about yet. And as a matter of fact, in a sick and twisted way, the fact that it isn't so low is actually more of a bullish indication 
education. It's not all willy nilly out there. You still have some bears who are fueling the market higher, basically, uh, by having to cover their shorts all the time. Let's take a look at the VIX futures. Stronger contango here, strong contango in the nine versus 30 day VIX. No issues with one day VIX. Across the board, volatility is more of a healthy thing for markets right now instead of a big red flag for a downdraft. QQQ weekly time frame chart. What do we see here from a candle structure and location perspective? Very similar to the S&Ps, obviously, with a solid green bodied bar. Not a lot to speak of in terms of upper or even lower wick on this one in particular. And buyers did a great job of closing strong at the top of the weekly range buyers in control structurally. If we think about location on the bar to bar count, we actually produced a lower low, very nuanced, but lower low there. And then obviously a glaring higher high. Think of this as a bullish engulfing bar. And it certainly does have more bullish than bearish implications with the sellers unable to materialize underneath the preceding red weekly bar. Same concepts in terms of spy and you know, the three bar play resolved in the upward direction. All the inside bars have broken out of the original container bar here. We've closed obviously up at the top. If it is going to turn into look above and fail, we can spot the lower high and a daily time frame chart. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Overall, the trend sequence is still firmly up with lower highs. You could start to think of the bottom of the balance, just like the S&Ps as 360 being your last set of lower highs from this balance right around in here. You've got your 360, of course. In terms of anchored view apps, those things are not even close to being in play. If we throw them on, maybe we've attached one to here. This starts to coincide with 360, the bottom of the range. This comes from the breakout of the April balance that was oh so painful. This is really where the AI mania gets kicked off, right? So 360 on the pullback does strike me as interesting from a weekly perspective. Nothing about this weekly bar would really imply that it's in play here. If we take out the volume profile for the QQQ, we've actually just like the S&P broken out over this high volume node. And there's certainly an opportunity for a retest, the top of the range and the high volume node to provide a little bit of confluence there for support. So instead of look above and fail and that being the dominating thought out there in your brain, how about break and retest on the QQQ weekly? Same idea out of the SPY, but a little bit more easy to spot here with our QQQ volume profile. In terms of Fibonacci perspectives to share with you, let's zoom in a little bit, obviously from the all time high, very congruent with what we did on the S&Ps, more price acceptance over the 61.8 increases the odds of the full blown 100% retracement. You can come in from the lows and do something like this. Your 38.2 is not really in play. The more interesting 38.2 is if you come from that same breakout point of the anchored view app we were just discussing for three, uh, th uh, 360, excuse me, your 38.2 on the weekly is also providing some confluence around that area. 359.83, if you want to split hairs with me here. Uh, let's take a look at the daily time frame chart and evaluate what's going on from a pullback perspective there. So we know the weekly is bullish. That kind of goes without saying. Uh, let's take a closer look at our daily time frame chart here. Inverted hammer, certainly. Let's first actually evaluate expected move. My apologies for skipping that. Expected move is definitely bullish with the higher high being implied at 386.30 and the higher low from here to here at uh, 3 371.82, nonetheless, also coinciding with the double top kind of breakout point from in here, very similar structurally to the S&P 500. Your gap to close is above that level. So a gap fill reversal would obviously be bullish as well. Inverted hammer from the Friday session looks massively above Thursday's high, closes back inside of Thursday's range. So could we see some deeper pullback out of the QQQ as opposed to the S&P? Everything about this structure kind of indicates that the buyers are a little bit more tired in the QQQ in my estimation, and you would want want to be watching your low in here. Let's take a closer look at the hourly time frame chart. Build that game plan for the upcoming week's worth of trade. Again, early morning. It's not that we have aggressive sellers. It's that buyers get tired and this thing kind of fades off into the close here, well above the opening range from the Thursday session. But you could kind of make the argument that this low is going to be your driving force because it's the inverted hammer low, 378.50. So what would I watch for out of the QQQ this week early on? Any consolidation here, no reason to even think about shorting the market. Obviously, break over the equal high at 382, sets up the move to the top of the weekly expected move, 386.30. Then beyond that is 388.75 as your pie in the sky target. If we do start to break down underneath, again, I'm not sure that shorting this, you don't want to overstay your welcome. If you want to short it to get there, that's fine. But I would be thinking about pullback buys here at the gap fill reversal or even the retest of the daily breakout point at 372.75. Gap closes from 375.65 down to 374.20. That's this range right here. We've got a little bit of a Swiss cheese uh, phenomenon going on with another gap underneath us, obviously from CPI back here. That's 370.25 to 368.50. Just like we discussed 
in the SPY, a more bearish look would definitely be a lower high here. That would be your look above and fail situation that we've been referring to on the weekly time frame charts. We would reevaluate and give you an update, obviously, on Wednesday if that starts to unfold in the coming week's worth of trade. Let's throw on the anchored view apps, see if we get any sort of confluence with these levels in here. Absolutely. Right. So your gap fill reversal with the anchored view app coming from here. This is the double bottom breakout type of look. Oops, sorry. There's your double bottom, right? There's the breakout. So coming from the right part of the double bottom, there's your first anchored view app confluence of support at the 374.20. And then your anchored view app from the head of the inverted head and shoulders is going to slowly over time, right? It may take all week, but it will slowly get there. Confluence of support at 372.75, the top of the equal high breakout from here, resistance, resistance kind of from the CPI, right? That would be your next pullback by level to be monitoring for. Let's take a look at the Fibonacci's and then we'll round it out with our internals and a market profile look. 38.2, couldn't have asked for anything better out of the Fibonacci from the head, pairing nicely with the breakout point from here. So just reconfirming the 372.75 level from that perspective. And if we come in from here up to the top, where is your 38.2? It's the top of the gap, right? So if you do respect this and this gap doesn't close, once again, sellers aren't doing their job from a FIB perspective. We're in the most bullish location. We will look for continuation after that. The only time to really be bearish in the QQQ now is if we do get that lower high. And I'm just not seeing it as a reasonable setup early on in the week. We'll again update you if things change by the time Wednesday rolls around. Here's are the internals. Same story as what we discussed over in the S&Ps. There's not even really a point in rehashing anything. Um, you know, th Friday is an obvious change in tone, an obvious change in tone. Buyers totally in the driver's seat as the breakout is unfolding. No major divergences to speak of from that perspective. Here are the NQ futures from the market profile. Same idea. The spike is not as clear on the Thursday session, but anyways, the point of control and value area are higher on Friday. We do have a poor low on Friday and it's also a mechanical low. So if I zoom in on this thing, you can see we've only got one tick of excess and it also goes right to the prior value area high. So it's mechanical and poor. If we take out the low of Friday's session, which should make sense also based on the inverted hammer on the uh, QQQ daily chart, right? You should be expecting a little bit of that pullback to unfold and we'll see if we can close the gap underneath us. That would be kind of in here out of your NQ futures. I would remind you similar things in terms of the spike from the uh, Tuesday to Wednesday gap up. If sellers were really going to reject these higher prices, you wouldn't have gotten price acceptance up here. You wouldn't have had the point of control migrate higher. So the buyers do, again, structurally seem like they are in the driver's seat. They're definitely in control. Could a little pullback unfold here? Absolutely. We know we're looking for pullback buys, not Armageddon type shorts. IWM Russell 2000 and the small caps Rusty, as we've been calling it recently, is going to round out the broad market. And this is finally playing catch up, if you will, with the remainder of the broad market, finally producing a structure and location bar that looks similar to the S&P and the QQQ. Solid green body bar, little upper wick, strong close at the highs. You guys get the point at this point. Obviously, buyers in control two for two location and structure. But what's most important about this is the fact that the weekly structure, if you sort of expand your horizon from the bar to bar count, is making progress in the upward direction. We've broken this balance range. If we double it in the upward direction, puts us on par with our highs up here. We know that we're looking for 200 out of the IWM weekly time frame chart. If you take a look at the anchored view apps, these things are much more so in play on the IWM. This has held up for support at the bottom of this weekly range, and we've currently broken out over the all-time high anchored view app. Now, we've done this a couple of times in the past, not, not strong, but a decent close above here, stronger close up above here. We've got it once again. Let's see if this time around we can get some follow through after the small caps have been basing for quite a while now, and the remainder of the broad market is certainly making a move in the upward direction. So ideally, we see on the weekly time frame chart, any pullbacks hold that for a higher low, and then we get some sort of continuation in the upward direction. Let's take a look at our volume profile here. Anything interesting going on? Absolutely. We know that the top of the weekly range also coincided with a high volume node here. We are in a low volume void. The next major overhead target becomes 200 once again, which is coinciding with structure from in this area. If we take out the Fibonacci's, because again, we've got to call a spade a spade. We can't just stack all the bullish data points. If we bring out the Fibs from all time high to the local low in here, we're still underneath the 38.2, even after the rally of last week. So is this still bear flag consolidation? Absolutely we will start to be more impressed when and if we can start to test the 61.8 or the flip side of the coin would be a break 
higher low that then finds support above the 38.2. That's obviously steps in the right direction as well, but would require multiple weekly bars. So it's not like we will have that confirmation in the coming weeks worth of trade. If you think about where we're at from this perspective, so obviously we've been going sideways, not really doing a whole lot of anything in small caps on the higher time frames, at least here. Uh, in this range, we certainly have recaptured now the 61.8, right? This is a solid break up above that. Ideally, we do not fall back down into this little weekly range in here. So let's take a closer look at that on the daily time frame chart. We'll throw the levels on and see what we can see from this perspective. Let's take a closer zoom. There we are. So expected move here, undoubtedly bullish. I know it doesn't look it because prices are elevated here, but if we think about the structure, let's make this easier on the eyes. There we go, that's much better. Um, obviously, this is a substantial higher high outside of the weekly balance. That was your breakout we just saw. Higher high is being projected at 195.25 roughly, and a higher low right around the retest of the breakout point, right? You've gotta think break and retest on the weekly is certainly a bullish look there. That key level is 188.25. Another thing that we were discussing in prior episodes about small caps was that, hey, this 184.75 level, it needs to resolve. We didn't really produce the lower high underneath. We didn't produce the higher low above. I mean, talk about a resolution, strong break in the upward direction. Now it's not even in play for a retest. We're looking for something like this. Again, that level is 188.25. Lower edge of the weekly expected move is confluence right around that zone as well. Uh, let's take a closer look at the hourly time frame chart to kind of build a game plan here out of the IWM. Certainly more of a liquidation break type, uh, you know, move lower on the Friday session as compared to everything else. This looked like mild selling activity, some profit taking. This is liquidation break undoubtedly on the IWM. The reason we can be a little bit more confident in saying that is that all the downside takes place in the first two hours of the day, and then it's sideways. We do not see sustained selling pressure, and we also reverse off of, or we hold rather, at a very nuanced level, right? Stronger new money sellers, they're not going to stop at a gap fill reversal level, right? So to me, liquidation break, longs with poor location up here close out as we fail to get acceptance over the Thursday high. Remember that S&P and QQQ all tested above Thursday's high. Obviously, IWM did not. So liquidation break is this move lower here. It doesn't really strike me as sol stronger selling pressure just yet. So game plan is anything that comes back into range is a look below and fail. Look below and fail. Higher lows over 191.75. Target the top 193.50. Then we'll look for the upper edge of the expected move. 194.50 is structural from off to the left. That's your bullish game plan, right? Something that does this. And then your still bullish game plan, but shorts to get there, just like everything else. Pull back by. It's all eyes on the 188.25. If we throw on the anchored view apps for the IWM, this is much more specific to the IWM. So I have a different study set coming from the lows, coming from the breakout bar in here, which kicked things off on Monday, right? Again, would strong. Stronger sellers care about an anchored view app to this move from Monday. Probably not, right? So liquidation break is confirmed once again. This will slowly start to creep higher if we're above it. Again, look below and fail. Definitely on the table with a higher low over 191.75. Confluence with the anchored view app coming from the low of the weekly balance range at the 188.25 retest. Here are the internals for the Russell side of things. Similar concepts. Again, not worth rehashing all the same ideas. But for the most part, look at the difference out of the Russell cumulative tick on the Friday session, right? So talking about, you know, liquidation break and not new money sellers absolutely confirms it with the cumulative tick down below here. If these were stronger sellers, again, you would have had a nasty cumulative build here or even something on par with what we saw from the, um, the S and P and the NASDAQ side of things. It just didn't happen, right? So liquidation break until proven otherwise here, not stronger sellers. And we can also go on over to the market profile. Sorry for the screen flash there. Russell, what did the Russell do? P shaped profile, short squeeze, B shaped profile, long liquidation right? So totally adds up. Um, no acceptance up here. So buyers basically trapped at the top, no acceptance over Thursday's high, long liquidation. If stronger sellers were going to get involved, we will likely see some kind of price acceptance underneath. Point of control, again, C period, great excess at the lows, not really concerned with what's going on there. We do have a poor high from the Thursday session. And again, you could carry that forward as being something that needs repair, or maybe what even kicked off the sort of breakdown in the first place, right? You can see B and M period back to back, two TPOs wide at the top, if we need some repair, that's over 1967 out of the Russell. We don't have stronger sellers. We're looking for pullback buys. If we take out this top, we should expect it to break on a test, uh, 1967 out of the rut. If you've made it to this point in the video, it's going to pay off because here is the sneak peek of the 50,000 subscribers wallets that we have produced. They've finally come in and we're getting ready to release them in the coming weeks worth of trade. There are quite literally only 50 of them that were produced, 50,000 subscribers, 
50 card holders were produced. So they're going to sell out instantly, I'm assuming, on the on the launch. So be prepared for that. Notifications better be on. There might be an announcement on Twitter. There might be an announcement in a YouTube video, bell button, all that good stuff. Let's get started with Apple here. What do we see on the Apple daily time frame chart? Multiple inside bars forming here. So it's very simple. We have an inside bar setup. If we take a look at the hourly time frame chart, we have a clear range that's been defined. We need a break and retest higher low over 191 or straight up continuation to get to 192.50, walk up your next target 193.75. Or if the bears are going to make a stand, you've really got to wait for the lower high. I would not be willing to just short this through the low at 189.25. But on the lower high confirmation, equal lows are back on the table. That's a daily kind of concern. If we go back here, right, you get something that kind of looks like an H pattern, right? If we get to here again, kind of game on for the deeper flush, we're simply not there yet. And obviously with Apple's strong daily uptrend, I wouldn't be overly, um, you know, anticipating a large, massive downdraft here. Earnings around the corner, obviously not yet though. Netflix, what do we see here? Daily time frame chart, definitely a bit concerning with the look above and fail from the Friday session, right? If we take a look at the hourly, it was looking pretty convincing on Thursday for the breakout of this overall range here. We were looking for higher low pullbacks to respect 446.50, absolutely not the case as of Friday's close. So begs the question, right? On any rally attempts, you're looking for lower highs once again under 446.50. That cements your look above and fail target over time would become the bottom of range at 431.50. You can play off of these nuanced interrange levels. I just wouldn't be overly uh, reliant on them for any type of bullish execution at this point. Uh, obviously, earnings also an issue on Thursday. Or was it Wednesday after the close? Wednesday after the close. Uh, what's going on with Tesla? Again, earnings on Wednesday after the close or Tuesday after the close. I can't, I'm getting my days mixed up here. But nonetheless, keep it in mind, as of right now, the look is for a higher low over 275, turns this into a pie in the sky, inverted head and shoulders, then a break up and over 281.75. Continuation goes to 287. 85, and then the range really opens up here in Tesla. Let me go out to a yearly time frame chart. Remember that this breakdown was very, very aggressive. So we don't have much structure until 309. So even though it may look attractive for the inverted head and shoulders to break the true neckline here at this level at the 181.75, you might want to be a little bit more patient and see a new uptrend develop over 287.85 for a little bit more confidence that we have a larger overhead range to be trading for. Just an idea. Where do the sellers really gain an edge? It's got to be a lower high underneath 275 at this point in time. That right shoulder does not want to produce a higher low. We want to break it if you're a seller and then do something that looks like this. Next up, Goog L. Um, you know, chat, hold me accountable. You guys recall from the Friday and Thursday stream. So we're just going to, it's a chart, right? A chart is a chart is a chart. What do we see here? It certainly broke the downtrend. So no longer really favoring the downside outcomes out of Google. There's your resistance trend line break. Strong consolidation up here at the highs. It did produce a daily inverted or indecisive doji rather. Uh, up here at these highs. So is it going to run out of steam? Was this a solid break? Absolutely. Uh, I think that this needs some resolution. It needs to build out another structure up here. I, like again, trying to think of this as a chart as a chart, this left thin structure behind us, but it was also a really impressive move to the upward direction. Kudos to anybody who caught it. I certainly didn't. Uh, but nonetheless, I think patience is the next play for Google. Let something set up here. Uh, in my eyes, again, maybe I'm still seeing it with a little bit of clouded judgment, not really having the cleanest indication of what may unfold next, especially with the indecisive doji from Friday, right? 125 can act as a magnet point. If we start getting acceptance above, definitely more bullish. If we start to fall underneath the thin structure retracement becomes a threat, but you can find a daily higher low above 122. 122 was a big, big area of contention. So that is Google. We're moving along. What's going on with Metaverse and Zuckerberg's fantasy land over here? Let's take a look at the daily time frame chart, right? Certainly a solid gap up that held. Not really a tradable outcome, though, for day two continuation of this range break. If we take a look at the hourly chart now, understanding that, right? If there are trapped buyers up here at the highs, any lower highs underneath that level at 310.85 set up the rotation for a breakdown through the thin structure here under 307.50 to retarget the top of the range. On the daily, it's a massive break retest. Can we find pullback buys here? That would be my thought at 297.25. If it does continue in the upward direction or we get some sort of ideal optimistic bull flag consolidation, next break over 317, about 10 points to run overhead 327.25. Next up, Nivda, what's going on? Is this a blow off top? I don't know, but I certainly wouldn't want to be the first one short in the door on NVIDIA. It did produce a higher high and a higher low on a bar to bar count. Is it a nasty red inverted hammer? Yes. But once again, I'm just not really like, this is where fortunes can be made, but don't 
don't forget about the other side of the equation. It's also where fortunes can be destroyed, right? So to me, the risk reward profile of a stock that's moving like this at all time highs, it's just not there. It's just not there. You need better structure if this pulls back deeper to close the gap and we can start to find, you know, a low that's being built out here, double bottom, inverted head and shoulders. All that stuff is good. That would probably be my next watch for NVIDIA. Can we find support at the top of the prior range? 436.50 is the level gap fill reversal, all that good stuff. If it falls deeper into the range, all bets are kind of off. We know that this was choppy. We know that this was kind of a magnet point at 421. Treat this one with a little bit of caution, right? Next up, Softy. What's going on with Softy? Gapping out of the range on Friday, but closing a nasty daily inverted hammer. There it is on the daily time frame chart. So what's the idea? Well, we certainly produced an equal high. If we want to find a daily higher low, it's over the top of the range. 342.25 is key support. Looking for pullback buys at that area. That would be uh, sort of a break retest. You know, you, you guys know the deal at this point. So 342.25 is the number there. And in the upward direction, first target would have to be the flush point from back here at 345.50, right? So something that does this, first target, then monitor for continuation. If you're skeptical of being the buyer here, you would wait for the higher low above 345.50. For bears to be in control, you gotta produce the lower high back down in range, then it would turn into a look above and fail, and we would target the bottom over time at 350, uh, 335 70 and then close the gap at 332.90. Nothing about this yet until we get price acceptance under this level is overly indicative on the short side. Amazon, what's going on with Nancy? You can see that we got a pretty solid move on Friday. There was at least some tradable outcomes there in the upward direction instead of uh, some other things that were just more choppy on Friday morning session, but for the most part, it gave it most of it back into the close, right? So I liked the fact that it was a break of the equal highs there. Very clear, um, you know, ascending triangle, cup and handle, whatever you wanted to call it on a smaller time frame, 15 or five minute chart. So solid breakout, went to resistance and is pulling back. So now what's the idea, right? If you're going to get a, uh, an hourly higher low, you want to support here at 134.40. It's the breakout level. Can we find support there? There's an hourly higher low. If you go to the daily time frame chart, again, nasty inverted hammer, but if we pull back deeper, Gap fill reversal is a break and retest level off of 13130. So really liking that as an attractive downside level as well if your broad market is more aggressively pulling back. If we do get that higher low on the hourly chart and break the equal high there at 136.75, next overhead target is 140.50. But for the most part, with Friday's interaction, I would probably be looking for either consolidation early on in the week and then see if we can make the equal high or a lower high here certainly starts to threaten the gap close. Again, 13130 is your number. If you've made it to this point in the video, I just want to take this time to say thank you. It means the world to me that I put these videos out. I put out the analysis and it doesn't just fall on deaf ears like some things do out in the ether of the internet, basically. So thank you. First trade idea, QCOM, Qualcomm Inc. What do we see here? From a higher time frame perspective, you're definitely getting a little bit of head and shoulders type activity, inverted head and shoulders, that is. And if we can break the neckline here, that's well and dandy. But if we even zoom in a little bit more nuanced to the daily time frame chart, you're also getting something that looks like double bottom. We have respected the neckline on this pullback from Friday. And lo and behold, you guys know if you've been watching the channel, this is a beautiful setup, right? This is a three bar play. If we can take out the two equal highs as a day trade scalp, you're certainly looking for the equal high back here. And of course, the inverted head and shoulders would have much higher implications. You could be looking at, you know, 128s roughly, and then eventually over time back up towards the head. That's a pie in the sky target. Not calling for that this week, obviously, but just talking about the three bar play. It looks good, right? Here it is on the hourly time frame chart. Mild pullback well above the neckline of the double bottom from this perspective in here, breaking the equal highs. There's your target as a day trade scalp. 123.23 breaks, 124.60 becomes your upside target. Next up, last but certainly not least, is SBU. X for Starbucks. What do we see with Starbucks? Very similar um, in the sense that here is your double bottom. The threat of this one, of course, on a higher time frame is sure, you've got head and shoulders. Your neckline is suspicious at 9660s, but it's not in play yet. It's not in play yet. And as of right now, with the neckline of the double bottom being in play, we've got thin structure through the breakdown. This little three day balance that's formed here after the gap up is actually recapturing the 50 SMA on the daily time frame. If we zoom in there, you can see the lower wick from Friday actually uh, supports that, excuse me. Taking a look at the hourly chart, just to give you an idea of the thin structure again, if we can clear 102.50, that's the neckline of the daily pattern, look left, there's your thin structure breakdown. There's not a whole lot to stop us until we come into the overhead supply bottom up here at 105. So an upside move out of Starbucks available on both the daily and the hourly, depending on how you wanna play this, looking for upside outcomes. That's gonna conclude today's episode of the weekly watch list. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything new, let me know down below in the comment section or by giving the video a very simple thumbs up. I hope to see you all on Monday morning, 8.15 for the pre-market prep, and I hope you also have a green trading week.